Brother Eric John Phelps with you today here with 24-7 World Radio with my podcast. And uh, it's, what is it, May the 7th, 2024, which is a Tuesday. So welcome to the broadcast today. I trust you're having a lovely day doing the Lord's will, seeking his face, reading his word, the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God as we have in our English version of the AV 1611 that in some places need to be clarified or even corrected pursuant to the rules of the translators in uh, the introduction of the translators of the AV 1611. However, we have perfect word of God and it has God's blessing upon it for the last 450 years nearly, and therefore we would never advocate having another Bible or another translation. So we stick to the word of God. That's the foundation for the Protestant Reformation in England, the foundation for America. And that is our final authority of faith and practice, not the Pope of Rome. So we welcome you to the broadcast today here at 24-7 World Radio. And I have with me our most distinguished guest that I try to have on every Tuesday, uh, Brother George Widger, who has taken a little rest for last week and, and has done some healing. And so I think his voice sounds much better. And uh, we're going to be uh, blessed with his presence with us today and some new facts that he always has that are generally shocking, or is delightful. So, Brother George, welcome to the broadcast. Well, thank you, Brother Eric. As always, it's a pleasure to be all with you. That's my pleasure also. Okay, so what would you like to cover today, my brother? Well, okay. Um, well, where do I start? Well, we'll start with our scripture verse. First Kings 14, verse 24. 1 Kings 14, verse 24. It says, and there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to the abominations, abominations of the nations, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Okay, uh, how should I put this? In many of the modern translations, such as the New International Version, say, i.e., the NI, NIV, they changed uh, Sodomite to male shrine prostitutes. So they like to soften the language. Well, that's typical because so you have much. Jesuits involved in the NIV, you know, and Cardinal Carlo, 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 Cardinal Martini. So he was probably a sodomite, and we don't want to use that word, do we? So go ahead, George. And uh, <laughs> you remember, um, well, that reminds me. Last week, uh, you know what, what the United Methodist Church decided to do? It wouldn't surprise me, George, <clears throat> but go ahead. So they, as a denomination, officially decided to officially uh, embrace homosexuality, allow people of that persuasion to become members of the church, to be pastors, to do uh, commitment cere ceremonies. Now, the, I was talking about what they have done as an, an aggregate, as a body. Now, there have been some individual congregations going back to the 1990s that have been practicing that. And this has created a huge rift. And, you know, I, this is almost 30 years ago, I, I've attended a number of different types of churches uh, over the years. And when I was living in Sacramento in the 1990s, I briefly attended a United Methodist Church. And it was just like, you know, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but even back then I knew that their, their theology was, say, suspect. And I'm not picking on Methodists per se, uh, because there have been a number of strong, great ones over the centuries, like uh, the Wesley brothers, John and Charles. Yeah, the, uh, the Methodist Church. George was, Whitfield. Yeah, George Whitfield. He was Methodist. I mean, God used him to bring the Great Awakening along with Jonathan Edwards. So the problem is the Jesuits have penetrated the Methodist organization. And so now they're just they're just as pro-Catholic as the Catholic Church and full of sin. So it's terrible what's happened to them. It used to, I have a book um, that I scanned in one of my 13 rare books from my Vatican assassins. And it's written by a Methodist minister. Romanism as a world power. Written by Kaufman. And it's a great little book. The Methodists. Remember, when Roosevelt went to Rome. He didn't go to the Vatican, but he also didn't go to the Methodist Church in Rome. Does he want to play politically correct? That's Theodore Roosevelt. So, uh, yep. 
So it's, it's totally apostate now. National Council of Churches, World Council of Churches, any Protestant or Baptist churches in the World Council or National Council is totally apostate, none in control of the Pope. Well, okay, go ahead, brother. Well, among other things, uh, the United Methodist Church is a part of the, is it CCT? Not CCP. <laughs> well, it's called uh, maybe, Christian Churches Together. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, the Chinese Communist Party. Well, yeah. Well, C CCT, Charlie Charlie Tang Tango, stands for Christian Churches Together. It's basically a consortium of apostate, Protestant, yeah. Eastern Orthodox, Catholic. Yes. <laughs> Translation. One big they're all, oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, all right. Contrary to popular belief, the, the popular ecumenical movement became became popular in the 1960s, although uh, there were antecedents to it prior to then. But um, uh, when I say contrary to popular uh, opinion, it wasn't the Catholic Church saying to these non-Catholic churches, say, hey, we want to dialogue with you to see what we can learn from you and what practices we can incorporate. No, we want to use the ecumenical movement to conquer you and bring you back to the bring you back home. Remember, the Council of Trent is called the Ecumenical Council of Trent. Yep. Counter-Reformation Ecumenical Council of Trent. Okay, and as were several other councils, like the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, mm -hmm. 325, and the Orange, and Carthage, and, you know, very, I, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert on, on my councils. Uh, but what Ecumenical means, Oikimene means worldwide. You know, we get our word economics from it. I see. And so the class home economics is actually redundant, but, that, but that's besides the point. So I would just like to bring up a couple of current events, if I may. Uh, over the weekend, was it on the 5th? Or was it Sunday? I guess at, British actor Bernard Hill died. And Can you say, that, say, uh, his, say his name again, George, and slowly. So I can get it. Bernard? Is it Bernard or Bernard, Bernard or what? Well, the British pronunciation is Bernard, but I, I actually had an uncle named Bernard. He was actually in Patton's Third Army, but that's, 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 that's besides the point. But this Bernard Hill was a British actor, and he went to Xavier High School in Manchester, England. Now, the Hills. What's the Xavier were, High School, George? Who's that affiliated with? It's a Jesuit high school. Oh, so this actor, another Jesuit coadjutor trained by them. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Now, he was prominent for a number of roles. Uh, he was in, I guess, the Lord of the Rings series, and uh, he did a number of a British TV programs like, yeah, e Cl I, Claudius. Um, also, however, his biggest role, he played Captain Edward James Smith in the Titanic. James Cameron uh, from 1997. I see. Yep, that Jesuit coadjutor, Captain Smith, who it is rumored didn't go down with the ship and was seen in New York City sometime. But but uh, anyway, go ahead, brother. Okay, that is something I had not heard, but it doesn't surprise me. Oh, me so neither. Was he was he drinking martinis and <laughs> drinking martinis and having a good laugh? After they killed all those those women and children sinking the ship just to get to the targets they wanted to eliminate, mm -hmm. they have no conscience. They're just savages. But go ahead. Well, well, you know, I heard somebody describe basically the cabal that runs this world, and I, I know you may have some issues with that language. Is basically a sex murder cult. Sex, murder, homosexual, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and of course, you know, people have you know debates as to who you know basically, well, you know, what is the cabal? Who runs it? You're kind of cutting uh, out, maybe, George. Yeah. For some reason, you're cutting out. You're kind of going, well, 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 you're cutting out somehow. So please stay with the microphone and talk slowly, okay? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll do. Okay, so some people might debate, you know. What exactly is the cabal, and what is its uh, infrastructure, 
and hierarchy and, and all that sort of stuff. However, yes, that would seem to be a fair assessment. They will basically murder whomever they have to to accomplish their ends, even people who are on their team, even people who are completely loyal to their team. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, in the protocols, the Jesuits was disguising themselves as Jews, saying, we even kill our own Freemasons. It's right in one of the protocols. <laughs> so the Jesuits who wrote it are saying that they kill their own Freemasons and get out of line. And Knights of Columbus, like Kennedy or uh, other Freemasons that get out of line. And, mm -hmm. So they kill their own if necessary, because it's wall war. And in, in war, the general will sacrifice his own soldiers to win a battle. Ah, uh, well, you know, if I can just mention something on a local nature, I just found this out this morning. That uh, something I, I mentioned before is I live in this fictitious place called the People's Republic of California, uh, and that's spelled with the K. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why um, I that I'm never going back. Yep, mm -hmm. uh, well, they destroyed you know, a beautiful state. Yep. Go well, ahead. you know. Yeah, you know, I say that tongue in cheek, but there's a a TV series, a mini series back in the 1980s called America, and it's spelled with a K. Uh, you is with Chris Christopherson and was it Robert Yurk was in it? So you have the high level Freemason Chris Christopherson who plays a collaborator, and you have the Roman Catholic Robert Yurk who's in it. So when you see something. Um, Spell with a K, like California or America. That that's a joke. That's a reference to how the Russians would spell it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, but, but maybe that's not a joke. But uh, anyhow, so as I said, I live in the People's Republic of California, and we have 58 counties. And here I go again, boring people with the extraneous details. And each county has a five-member board of supervisors. They theoretically are elected every four years. And I say theoretically. In reality, they're selected. Well, one of our board of supervisors is a, a young woman by the name of Linda Hopkins. She just turned 41 last month, on the April the 14th. And she, I think, is a woman. And I think she's heterosexual. And I think she's married to a man. But who knows? As it, she apparently has three children. And well, she just hopefully, released hopefully her a real children. And yeah, hopefully that's a result of their marriage, something normal. Yeah, go ahead, George. Okay, so well, please bear with me just a moment. So she just revealed that she had a, a routine mammogram last week or so, or well, a month or so. So they decided to do, um, forgive me for being graphic here, basically they decided to uh, test one of her, I guess her left breast, and it turns out they did, the doctors discovered a tumor. And so she's going to be preemptively having a mastectomy. Oh, I either, it's awful. Awful. So, it's a hard, stone-hearted man to cut off a woman's breast, whether he's yeah. a doctor or a criminal, but it's terrible. And, you know, those breast tumors are easily reversible if you know what's causing them. But to cut off the breast is so savage and such a denial of such an admittance that they don't know what causes it. That it's just awful. And I, I hate to see that happen to any woman. But go ahead. OK, well, any, I don't. OK, I looked in her background. Uh, it turns out there's a story appeared in our local paper a few years ago. She grew up Episcopalian and she got her undergrad degree from Stanford. So. I don't know if she was in a sorority while she was down there in Palo Alto, probably was. But during the whole Corona hoax tyranny, she was probably just as egregious as anybody else in terms of enforcing these policies. So at minimum, she's incompetent. but Or she could be blackmailed or bribed or who knows. But she was all on board for all the tyranny, not just you know the shutdowns, the restrictions, the mask requirements. But the vaccine requirements and all that sort of I, I, well, it just shows that she is a coadjutor and she was working for her masters and being obedient 
as most women are when they're in places of political power. They do exactly what they're told. That's why the Jesuits like to put them there. Go ahead. So is it possible? Now, I don't know this for a fact, but uh, nobody has brought up the possibility. Gee, it could have been something she injected her into her body the last few years. I don't know. I'm not making any accusations. Any accusations? Well, you know, it's been discovered. It has been discovered through reliable doctors that <clears throat> the women that have abortions are more prone to get breast cancer. Now, remember, cancer is fungus and parasites. So there's some weakness that takes place in the breast that enables them to be in invaded, infected, and then the process begins. But there's a, there's a connection between abortion and breast cancer. Go ahead, well, George. Well, okay, so... As I said, I'm not an oncologist, and I don't play on one on television. However, one of the situations that has arisen in the last few years is a massive proliferation of cancers of all types. And people who hitherto did not get them, they did not, you know, she was just like, you know, just 40, just 40 years old when she got the diagnosis, or about 40 years old. And so, in addition to other conditions like myocarditis, pericarditis, embolism, thrombosis, uh, basically those are heart conditions or developing clots in your lungs. Yep. Uh, there's been a huge explosion of cancers, as I said, and people who otherwise would not be getting them. This has happened last you know, three, four years. And People are, you know, doctors are baffled as to why this is happening. Well, maybe it's climate change. Maybe it's uh, white supremacy. Yeah, that, that's it. That's, that's it. And these are toxic alpha males. That's what causes cancer. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Or, or uh, white uh, nationalism or separation. You know, all th those must be the corporate system. Any, any white men in general, all evil, especially those of us who advocate for racial separation and the nationhood. We want to live around our own people, and preserve our own people. By the way, there's some white wealthy men in in uh, Louisiana. Uh, it's, it's not Boca Raton, but it's Baton Rouge. They're separating and they're starting their own white community in Baton Rouge. That's a good oh, I, I'm sorry, I thought ba Boca Raton was in Florida. Yeah, Boca Raton is Florida, but Baton Rouge is Louisiana. So it's Baton Rouge that this is taking place in. Okay. Oh, well, well, good for them. Good for them. That's right. Maybe their children won't get beat up every day in school or maybe even killed. So that'll be nice. Uh, yes. Well, you know, th that reminds me. You, you know, you always say something that triggers yes, a, good an idea. a good memory. Okay, go ahead, George. <laughs> well, I, I suppose or hope that's the case. Um, or where, where was I? I always, you know, if it weren't for my computer, I'd be lost. <laughs> I'd have to be, you know, talking from off, off the top of my head. Well, you know, the what was I saying? Okay, so you're talking about the supervisor who has just. Um, been diagnosed with breast cancer, and she's going to be ha taking, um, uh, having a mastectomy, having one of her breasts removed. And, and that, to me, that sounds so draconian, so yes. savage. If these women would clean their colons, use colon cleanse regime that I've used for years and recommended to other people, and if they would use proper parasite cleanse like black walnut, and wormwood and cloves, if they would use that, heavy doses of that, all these parasites would start flooding out of them, and if they would do soaks in the bath with baking soda, which is the most alkaline thing we know of, uh, niter that we know of today, in, in conjunction with Celtic sea salt to alkaline their system and kill down their fungus, they could reverse their cancers and they wouldn't get cancer, because cancer is parasite and fungus. So. They want to do anything but the right thing, and so unfortunately, this this inquisition, this cancer inquisition, is going to continue. Uh, and of course, you know something I read that whenever the communists take over a country, they you have useful idiots that help facilitate this in Russia or Czechoslovakia or Poland or China. But once these 
this little idiots about live their usefulness, they, well, <laughs> they discard them. And I, I'm not saying that's necessarily happening here with uh, Linda Hopkins, but that could very well be the case. Oh, sure. We've been under communism since FDR, March 9th, 1933. He was a communist, a high-level Freemason, 32nd degree, overseen by Jesuit Edmund Walsh, and they, the Jesuits implemented their beloved communism that they had perfected on their South American reductions, and they introduced it here and have shoved it down our throats for the last 90 years. So, yep. Got to destroy the Reformation. Got to destroy those white men who read the Bible and are born out of the Protestant Reformation because they got to go if we're going to have return to the Pope's Dark Ages. It's just that simple. Well, if I could just mention um, something about Linda Ho uh, Ms. Hopkins. She, as I said, she was all aboard, all, all on board for the tyranny, uh, the tyranny that we were subjected to a few years ago. Um, and that she posted videos and pictures of her children wearing masks or little children under the age of 10. Oh. Uh, and uh, when she was chairman of the Board of Supervisors, you know, she was very strict about enforcing the policy. And she has something like five or six sheriff's deputies acting as armed thugs to enforce the policy. And uh, also there's a story that appeared in a local paper. This is back in January of 2021, so over three years ago about a local church that decided to defy the shutdown order. Now, this is probably a, a apostate 501c3 religious building. Well, they said, you know what? We're not going to shut down anymore. We're going to open up and have services, and we're not going to have people wear masks or require people to wear masks. And she actually gave a comment at the local paper. She said, well, this is egregious because this might uh, – inspire other churches to go ro rogue and defy the order. Yeah, when they didn't have any lawful authority to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, just, put, just put a woman in charge, tell her what to do, and she'll do anything you tell her to do. To uh, violate the Constitution, violate the law, because they're going to impose tyranny by the wicked men who t ordered her to do so. So that's why they like him there, and she did a good job. It's like uh, that one in Minnesota, what was it? Illinois, Gretchen, what her name I is? I believe that's Michigan. In Michigan, okay. But I you had a similar little feminist tyrant. All feminists are tyrants. Every last feminist you'll ever meet is a well, tyrant. Yeah. Let me tell you, tell you what to do. When you get in political power, they get in political power, they are tyrannical. So that's why the Jesuits started feminism. They love feminism, and then they put these feminists in power and further destroyed the country. And when a country's under national judgment, it's ruled by women and children, as this country is. Well, you know, they did the same thing on a national level in New Zealand. They put that Jacinta Arhern or Ardern, however you say, who grew up Mormon, which is a Freemasonic. That's right. It's a Freemasonic yes, operation. operation. Joseph Smith Freemason, Brigham Young Freemason. And you can see Masonic symbols at the temple in Utah. And the holy underwear that the men wear and the women wear has a, a compass and a square on it. I had a lady that was saved, and she sent me some of that Mormon holy underwear. I have it on my shelf here. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, anyhow, so they rewarded Jacinta by maybe her, I guess, higher here at uh, Harvard. I, I'm getting yeah. feedback from you, George. I don't know what's going on. You're in there, but. Okay, I'm sorry. My neighbor is mowing his lawn. <laughs> okay. So, sorry about that. that that's uh, We still. Bonds are still legal in California, so I guess he's enjoying that while that's still the case. Um, <laughs> okay, but you're at your desk now. You're not walking around, right? No, no I'm sitting right here. Okay. Uh, anyhow, uh, the so just Cynthia Arhern is now a professor at Harvard University. Yeah, she's a professor at Harvard. What's her name again? Yeah. Jacinta Arhern. She was the previously the prime minister of New Zealand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I am listening. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So I, I don't have a punchline, but and then besides the whole corona nonsense, before that you had the whole Christchurch 
Christchurch shooting on March the 15th, 2019, at a couple of boss in Christchurch. That happened under her watch. Mm-hmm. Well, that's something she can be proud of. I have a contact there in Australia and New Zealand. It is complete and total government op. So. Well, and if you say that, that they'll label you, they'll label you a conspiracy theorist. Oh, why well, I would enjoy that because that's the true understanding of history. Nothing happens by coincidence. These coincidence, coincidence theorists, did they just happen to get married by coincidence? And did the wife just happen to have a baby by coincidence? And, you know, uh, everything is coincidence. There's no understanding for it. Nobody can explain anything. Just do what you're told, and be an atheist, and watch the TV and eat potato chips. Go ahead, George. Well, yes. And, and of course, uh, you know, wash that down with plenty, plenty of beer. Um, it, it, anyhow, <laughs> well, yeah. You know, I mentioned that Art Jacinta Arherner Ar- is now a professor at Harvard, so she's teaching students how to destroy their country. Sure. Harvard is a complete and total communist operation overseen by the Jesuits. They run Harvard. Well, you know, we're just talking about an Ivy League school, Harvard, in Massachusetts, but I can actually give some receipts about another Ivy League school in Vermont called Dartmouth. Are you familiar with that? Dartmouth, okay. Now, it was established in 1769, uh, before America actually even became a country. And now, something I mentioned and It was before, established by white Protestant people who read the Reformation Bible, the King James Bible. Yeah. That's what those people do. They start schools. They educate their children. They educate their young men in sciences and the arts. And, you know, they have an educated culture and they learn how to read and write and they have libraries and they develop new sciences. That's what these white Protestants and Baptists have done who read the Reformation Bible. That's these some of the schools they started. All the Ivy League schools were started by Protestants and Baptists involved too. Well, it, okay. All right. So something I mentioned to you before, so forgive me for repeating myself, when you're looking at a corporation, it's run by a board of directors. Those are the people who call the shots. Well, when you're looking at an academic institution, such as a college or university, it's run by a board of trustees. Now, forgive me for <laughs> throwing in all those superfluous details. Now, there are 26 members of the board of trustees for Dartmouth. And I know, so you may be wondering, how does the whore, i.e. the Catholic Church, have her hooks in them? Well, I can just share a couple of names. Susan Finnegan. Susan Finnegan. She sounds like a little Irish girl. <laughs> uh, I, lad, how'd you know? Mm-hmm. Well, she got her JD or uh, yours doctorate from Boston College. Boston, Boston she, College. The Jesuits. The Jesuits, that's right. Oh, goody. Okay. Well, I'm sure she's very well educated, and I'm sure they have placed her in a place where they're gonna, she's going to serve them in their empire. So, great. Another JD, Irish Catholic, trained by the Jesuits to war for Holy Mother Church, and destruction of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Western civilization. Great. Well, well, yes. Now, another member of the board of trustees of Dartmouth there's a fellow by the name of Neil Katyal, K-A-T-Y-A-L. He's a law professor at Georgetown University. Ah, Neil Katyal. Is he cat call or just Katyal? Neither Cat. What's his name? Katyal. What's his first name? Neil, as in Neil. Uh, Neil, uh, Neil Cat. Uh, Neil Katyal. So he's a he's a professor or a fill-in professor. They call him adjunct professors. At Jesuit Georgetown, right? Uh, correct. So we have the Georgetown connection to Dartmouth College. Uh, great. By the way, there's a very, very wonderful Supreme Court case called Dartmouth College versus Woodward. We'll talk about that someday. But all right, go ahead, George. Okay. Now, basically, I had a couple of topics I wanted to cover. Uh, the main one of the topics is Catholic control 
of not ostensibly non-Catholic higher education. Now, I was just giving you a specific example with Dartmouth, how they run, run that. But I just wanted to pause for a second because this is a little bit off topic because I just came across his name recently. Are you familiar with Professor Mark Mason? N A, I'm sorry, uh, N A I S O N. Mark Nason. Never heard of him. Okay, most but people have. Be, but he's got to be one of the gods if he's a professor. Uh, okay. cor uh, uh, correct. Now, he was born in sometime 1946. I don't have a birthday for him. He was born in Brooklyn, New York. Both of his parents were Jewish academics. See? Um, so it gets even better. Uh, both of his parents were actually members of Communist Party USA. Great. So this is the Jesuit canard of always having leading Jews that are left-wing socialist communists, especially in academia. So they, they fit the bill perfectly. God help us to find a, a Jew in academia that's conservative and wants to preserve limited government. I mean, they're maybe even non-existent. I don't know of anyone, but that's just further builds the right so the right can blame the Jewish ac academics in general for all being communists as exactly what was done in Nazi Germany. All the Jews are communists. Okay. Okay, so he got his undergrad degree from Columbia University. So as I said, his parents were Jewish communists from Brooklyn, New York. And okay, what's the punchline? Well, He's a retired history professor at, at Fordham. Whoa. Retired history professor at Jesuit Fordham. That means he loves the Jesuits. They were his masters. They, they paid him to tell his lies in history class. How many years was he a professional liar for the Jesuits at Fordham? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't have a start date, but you're talking probably decades, well yeah. over 30 years. And you know, it's really a disgrace. These American white men and women, these husbands and wives that are so stupid as to send their children to be brainwashed at these Jesuit institutions by the left wing socialist communist Jesuits and their upfront Jews. So what's wrong with these parents? Why do they send their children there? And it's expensive too. It costs a lot of money to become a communist trained by Jesuits at Fordham. Go ahead, George. Well, you had to ask uh, Fred Trump, the father of Donald Trump, why didn't he do that? Yeah, because he was busy serving the Jesuits in New York City. He knew the Jesuits ran New York. So why not join them? Send your son to Fordham and, and Ron Donald or uh, Donald and uh, Trump can send his, his children to Jesuit Fordham or Georgetown and Biden can do the same because we all have to be educated by the Jesuits. They're such wonderful educators. And, oh, our children will then have a job after they're educated. By the way, Michael Riconosciuto, who is a, that uh, boy genius who later worked for intelligence and developing things. And you can see this on the Netflix uh, program, um, The Octopus. He was trained by Jesuits, just like Davis Ferry. What, what do you got going on in the background there, George? I'm sorry, my neighbor is still mowing his lawn. <laughs> I, I told him, hey, I'm doing a show, but I guess is um you know it's just at it's about twelve 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 here. That's so okay. he'll That's all right. We'll just continue on. Go ahead. Okay. So you know, so you said you never heard prior to now you never heard of this Mark Nason. Well oh. specifically he taught he taught uh, African and African American studies. Oh, that means he taught white people to hate themselves and to glorify the black man. And he's the black man's the greatest race in the world. And all they've ever done is be held down by these wicked white men. And that's probably the summation of what he did. There's probably not one white man that ever was right or decent to the blacks in America. And that's the communist uh, propaganda here. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so he wrote a book back in 1983, so just over 40 years ago, called um, Communist in Harlem during the depression. And he also has written a number of articles on the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s and um, 
he wrote a biography of A. Philip Randolph. So I, I just wondering, was some of this spoon fed to him by people like? Oh, so I guess he obviously you're you're cutting almost certainly had to know. Coach. You're okay. cutting out again for some reason. I don't know what's wrong with your computer or your microphone, but it's aggravating. You okay. got not cut out anymore, okay? All right. Uh, check, check. How, how's my audio? Much better. You okay. can't turn away from your microphone. I never turn away from my microphone. Okay. So, okay. so it's, it's almost certain that this nascent new uh, Dulles. Avery Dulles. Ah, Jesuit Avery Dulles of Fordham? Yes. Yeah, the one who became a cardinal? Yes. The one who wrote the introduction to the to the Council of the Second Vatican Council, the documents of the Second Vatican Council, that same Avery Dulles? Uh, yes, the son of, what was it? Okay. John Foster. He was the son of John Foster Dulles. And the nephew of Alan. The brother of Alan. Oh, oh, well, I mean, well, John Foster and Alan Dulles were brothers, and um, Avery was a nephew. That's a right. Was a nephew. Yes, he was um, a Avery Dulles, S.J. Later, Avery Cardinal Dulles. Yep. And so he was big in the New York Jesuit province at the time when there were ten provinces. He was in the New York province. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Uh, as I said, so as I as I was saying, Mark Nason w wasn't really involved with. Well, he's definitely involved with education and propaganda and rewriting history, but he wasn't really involved with non-Catholic education. Other than the fact that he got his undergrad degree from Columbia. Well, Columbia, so, New York, is as Jesuit-controlled as possible. I mean, <laughs> it's just another one of their tentacles. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, in, in indeed. Now, okay, I'd just like to, so the main thrust of my argument is Catholic control or Vatican control of non-Catholic education, non-Catholic higher education. And what are the... Well, well that's easy to prove, George. What, is there any of, these, any, any of these universities teaching about the temporal power of the Pope? Hmm? Any of them teaching that the Pope believes he has the right to rule all the governments of the world, no matter what the people want? Any of these universities teaching the doctrine of the temporal power? None of them. Uh, not so much. Yeah, never. Because there might be some little Catholic girl there that gets all offended because he talked about the Catholic Church, mommy and daddy, and, and now we get to go and protest and whatever, so... No one wants to offend them by telling the truth, so they'll just go along with the heresy and the travesty of never saying anything right and truthful about the greatest oppressive organization in the world, Roman Catholic institution, run by the Jesuits. Uh, okay, so I'd just like to give you another example. Now, Dartmouth ostensibly is a secular school in Vermont. Well, I'd just like to give you an example of an ostensibly Protestant school in uh, is in Michigan, where um, Battle Creek, Michigan, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm sure somebody's gonna. <laughs> um, I should know this. Um, okay, it's in Michigan. Okay, well, there's a Protestant institution in Michigan. Okay, go ahead. Called Calvin College. It's a Calvin. Okay, it, it, Calvin College, mm -hmm. that's yes. totally apostate. They, they, they departed from the Reformation Bible. They departed from the Bible John Calvin read from. And they departed from the doctrines of true Calvinism. And they're, they're just completely apostate. And of course, they would never take up the sword of just offense against the political tyranny. Why, that's not turning the other cheek or, yeah. So they're totally apostate. They're Romanized and no power in the preaching. There's no real preaching there. Go ahead, brother. Uh, okay. So, yes, they're in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they opened in 1876. So, 148 years ago. So, almost a century and a half, a century and a half ago. Now, they currently have nine instructors and professors in their theology departments. However, one of whom 
that Daniel Harlow got his yes, he got his PhD from Notre Dame. Oh, goody. He also so, got his master's degree. So we got PhD from Notre Dame. Where else now? Well, he also got his master's from uh, Notre Dame. Wonderful. So his master's, and then we on to his doctorate. He got it from Notre Dame. Well, did he get trained by Theodore Hesburgh? Good Teddy. Russ, Teddy and uh, Nancy, the, the two homosexuals at Notre Dame. Uh, yeah, okay, did he, was he trained by them? Goody. There's an excellent chance because he got his PhD back in the 1990s. No. I was, I, was in a, I was in a meeting of our chiropractors, and there was a chiropractor there who had graduated from Notre Dame, and he told me that Theodore Hesburgh had 140 honorary degrees. Yep. Uh, right. Yep. Only 140. Well, he has. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I guess uh, Ted liked getting his honorary degrees and. And uh, Fidel Castro likes hiring his illegitimate children. That's right. George, you need an honorary degree, okay? I think I'm going to confer on you an honorary degree. Would you like that? I'll get one of those hats and you can move your tassel and give you that, that uh, skin. And George, <laughs> George Weger has graduated from the School of Reformation Bible Church, and he is now Dr. George Weger. Dr. George, please come and speak to us. Well, thank you. Well, I, I guess I'll need to take up uh, golf lessons. So, uh -huh. anyhow, the um, so another professor they have there is Gil Messick. I, I'm sorry, not Gil. Claire, Claire Messick. Claire Messick. Messick sounds Jewish, is it? Oh, how come her rabbi didn't tell me that? Um, anyhow, she. Um, so this is her CV. She got her undergrad degree from University of Chicago. And she, too, also got her master's and Ph.D. from Notre Dame. Oh, goody. Just like Condoleezza Rice and all those other centers. Yeah. Wonderful. I guess you're qualified now to teach. You can do whatever you want to do if you've got degrees from that place. I can't okay. recommend too much, George, the book by Zygmunt Dobbs called The Great Deceit. And then the subtitle is The Pseudo-Social Sciences. And he shows you that the first two years of any university training is sheer brainwashing in, in infidelity, in atheism, and uh, Bible rejection. And that's the, that's the baptism everybody has to go through before they can move on to do what they really want to do. So it's awful. But again, the book is Great to See. Great to see. Okay, so... I was talking about a couple of current professors in the theology department at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, but I'd just like to bring up uh, a retired professor. She's known as uh, Emeritus, Christina de Groot. Uh, so she's probably of Dutch descent. Mm -hmm. As I said, she's a retired, so she's no longer on staff. She's a retired. She's cut, probably, out, cut out. She's a retired what, George? A sociologist? Is that what you said? A theology professor at uh, Calvin College. A woman theology professor? Correct. Just yeah. like this other girl, Claire Messick. Wonderful. So that's another violation of Scripture. Women are not to teach doctrine. They're not to be theologians. So uh, you probably could have a long list of heresies that they are dispelling. Go ahead, George. Okay, and there's something, a little detail I forgot to mention about Professor uh, Messick. Now, I told you where she got her degrees, but something I didn't tell you was about her her courses. Um, she teaches a class on biblical literature and theology, social justice. Oh, the social justice. Jesuit Luigi Taparelli, social justice. Goody, which means beat down the white man and raise up the blacks and Anybody else so that we can just continue to beat down the white man. Social justice. Go ahead. Beat okay, down the white man primarily, but go ahead, George. Okay, so you have this retired professor, uh, Christina De Groot. D-E-G-R-O-T, De Groot. Now, 
<laughs> her background is similar to her other colleagues. Um, she got her undergrad degree from Loyola University in Chicago. Oh, goody, Jesuit Ignatius Loyola of Chicago. That's wonderful. She must really be a college uh, teacher. She also got her Master's of Divinity from the University of Chicago, and she got her PhD from Notre Dame. <laughs> it's all apostates, heretics, infidels, blasphemers, and now the women can join them, and they can join in the blasphemy, and, and they can be women up there teaching the Bible or their philosophy to all these people, and these men are going to sit in the congregation put up with it because they don't know any better to get up and walk out. Go ahead, George. Okay, so, um, and of course, something has been going on for the last several weeks at campuses in the U.S. and other countries in Europe, uh, Canada, and so forth, is there have been all sorts of student protests about what's been going on in Israel since October the 7th. It's not so much the Hamas attack, but it's been the Israeli Defense Forces response. Now, as I said, the, the attack took place on the 7th of October last year, which is Battle of Lepanto Day. Also, it was, it was on that date in 2001, the United States went into Afghanistan. Well, now, George, that's a coincidence. Now, we have to stop this conspiracy stuff, and it's just a coincidence that the savage Muslims attacked the Jews in, in Gaza on October 7th, and it's... Uh, it's a coincidence that the savage American military attacked Afghanistan on October 7th. And so all the, these armies busy working for the Pope and the killing of targeted populations. And don't misunderstand me, the Jews have a right to their land. Gaza is Judah. Um, and these Arabs, I don't call them Palestinians. There's no such person. They have a right to leave. But you see the Egyptians have blockaded the southern border of Gaza and they can't leave. So... They're a wild card to justify more anti-Jewish fury in Israel so that they can commit more crime. So it's a, it's a wonderful dialectic. The Jesuits running the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. And they're going to create anti-Jewish okay, really, fury. Yeah. yeah. The whole purpose is create anti-Jewish fury. But go ahead. Okay. I, I realize we, discovered, we discussed this roughly seven months ago when the first took place. But just for the record, I'm uh, – Mossad, the Mossad, which is the Israeli secret police, they're basically FBI and CIA and NSA all rolled into one. Uh, they created so them all. They were, they were started by Reinhard Galen in 1951, according to the book, The Secret War Against the Jews by Loftus. Okay, So they were started by what became the Nazi SS as its building its international intelligence community after the war, and Mossad is a part of it. That's why they did their best to eliminate the Irgun. The Irgun were the truly patriotic Jews who wanted their own country, and they were affiliated with Vladimir Jabotinsky and the revisionist Zionists. But the Jesuits destroyed that party, killed Jabotinsky and Hunter in New York, and that was the end of the Irgun, and what was left, they had to join Mossad, which was Haganah turned Mossad. So, absolutely, they're controlled by the Jesuits, and they're part of the international intelligence community, and they are not there for the benefit of their people in Israel. Go ahead, George. So, just for, for the record, and I said this in October, but Hamas is a Mossad creation. Well, there's no doubt that the leader of Hamas works with Benjamin Netanyahu, and the leader of Hamas is a billionaire, and he lives in Qatar. So they orchestrated this whole event together. I wouldn't blame Mossad as the sole creator of Hamas, <clears throat> because the Knights of Malta are very much a part of the creation of that agitation, because this agitation cannot end. The only one that's going to end the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the final Pope of Rome, with his covenant beginning the 70th week of Daniel yet to come. So in the meantime, they got to keep stoking the agitation. So both sides working together for the Gaza invasion. Okay, so anyhow, and if it could, so there have been all these protests in campuses across the U.S. Harvard, Dartmouth, <laughs> Northwestern, uh, Stanford, uh, UCLA, and probably the, one of the biggest 
protest has been at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And it turns out the provost there is Darnell Hunt. And Sounds he like got his... Black. Is he a black man? Uh, yes, he is. Darnell, how did I know? But go ahead. Oh, okay, so he got his master's degree from Georgetown University. Ah, good. So step and fetch it from the, with the Jesuits will go out and do exactly what they tell him to do in the destruction of these wicked white people and the destruction of these Jews, too. Yeah. And I and I often wonder, you know, are these Jewish people in this country going to wake up and realize that the left, the Democratic Communist Party that they've been a part of for years is going to create anti-Jewish fury here to kill them or to, at least to drive them out of the country? Did they ever think about that? Did they ever apologize for being socialist communists for the last 60, 70 years? Hmm? Go ahead, George. Well, so you have, you know, this is something that's been going on since at least the, not, the 1960s off and on. You know, you have the anti-war to, anti -war protests uh, at basically the same schools. And, you know, those are for different reasons. But you had to wonder... How many of these protesters are actual students? How many of them are FBI? Yeah, yeah. one of my advisors, uh, Brother Tim, talked about the FBI involved in the Kansas State shooting. And, and one of their agents cut the fire hose to keep from burning down ROTC buildings. So it's uh, without a doubt, it's all orchestrated. These things just don't happen. There have to be leaders. They have to have a plan. It wasn't just a bunch of students at Kent State or wherever you want to call it, just getting together and doing this. They're all led by certain coadjutors, leaders. They've been group, they're provocateurs, led to do this and organizing it. But that would be conspiracy, George, and we can't believe that. So these things just happen out of thin air, George, and don't know how it happens. Oh, George. <laughs> well, yes, I, I, I agree. Now, um, you know, you're talking about. I know we've talked about January the 6th several times, and that was that happened over three years ago. But there again, you had to wonder how many of these people who are at the Capitol building were legitimate protesters, probably most. But how many of them were FBI agents? How many of them were FBI assets? I.e., they were either paid or they're blackmailed. Sure, oh, they're paid. They're, they love it. George, they love it. They love that agitation. And so they were busy doing the bidding of they're Jesuit coadjutor masters. That's why the Capitol Police didn't stop anything. They just watched it take place because their brother coadjutors were busy leading it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course, you know, just you know, going back to October the 7th, what happened in Israel. The Israeli Defense Forces stood down for at least six hours. That's right. Seven hours. Okay. All right. Okay. I said at least six. Six. Okay. We'll say seven hours. Um so, uh, regardless, they stood down for hours. Why was that? Well, they were afraid, George. They were afraid, and, the, and they, they didn't want to go there because they might have to shoot someone. And Oh, we can't do that. We're going to have to shoot some of these Arab savages. And so, Arab Muslim savages, we can't want to do that because we're all the same. And we believe in universal equality and uh and what's uh, Luigi Taparelli's social justice? And so we, we're just going to let them kill those Jewish people because, after all, they really deserve killing anyway, you know? Uh, so they can justify anything, but any fighting to present, prevent that? Oh, that's so evil, George. Yeah, so we're just going to stand down and let them kill those people. By the way, Ben Shapiro does not talk about the Mossad and the Israeli government there working for the Pope that helped facilitate that invasion. Because the Mossad and their agents are everywhere. When I was in Israel many years ago, my friend Joel Bainerman, who wrote uh, the book on George W. Bush, I think it's The Crimes of the President, he told me, Eric, Mossad is everywhere. They are patrolling everything, and there's nothing that happens in Israel or about to happen that they don't know about. Because after all, the CIA is there advising Mossad. Remember James Angleton in CIA manned the Israeli desk and the Vatican desk. So they're apprised about everything because the Pope has to protect his Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, that it will never be dissolved in the, in the future for the building of Solomon's third temple, or the third Hebrew temple, for the Pope of Rome, overseen by his Templars. So 
That's why they have this agitation. That's to the targeted end. So they both work together. Hamas and Qatar and, and Mossad and Tel Aviv. Okay, so. Okay, just like uh, I have this for various sources, the CIA is in Ukraine right now. They're there. They've been in there for probably decades. Of course. And, you know, another. So they're, the CIA is working with the. What they. What are they calling the KGB these days? Uh, with the, the GRU? No, the FSB and the SVR. SVR is overseas. FSB is inside the country. Just like FBI is supposed to be inside the country here and the CIA is supposed to be outside the country. So the, they're, the, twin, okay. the twins in Russia are the FSB and SVR. Uh, okay, well, thank you, for the, okay, thank you for the clarification. It does, does, it, does it really matter what they call them? It's the same thing. That's right. they, they just keep every generation or so they change the names. It was originally the call the Cheka, then it became the NKVD, heavy emphasis on VD. <laughs> right. Um, yep. Then it, finally, it became it became after the war it became the KGB. Then after the Pope's uh, Cold War, they decided to call it the GRU or the PPG or, or whatever. S- SVR. Okay, GRU. Oh, okay. well, well, it doesn't matter what they call it. I mean, I don't mean to sound impertinent, but it's basically the same thing. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And it's like Snowden. It's ridiculous he goes to Russia and tells that the CIA is doing that. Because the CIA and the, and the SVR work together. NSA is you know, overseeing all the Pope's international intelligence community with the, with the Pentagon. I mean, it's all centered in the District of Catholics here. So... Mm-hmm. It, it, indeed. So, I just want to. So, I was talking. So, I, I spent the bulk of our stream talking about education. And I, I mentioned a couple of current events, but I'd just like to uh, close out talking about a couple of air disasters, if I could, or something involving uh, air travel. So, sure. last year, back in a- April, right about the 10th, I was listening to a program online called. Um, Truth Frequency Radio with Zach Hubbard. Now, I have a number of disagreements with Zach, and I'm not going to go to that. And so this was around about April the 10th of last year. And so this young Polish woman, a woman who was living in the United States, who's from Poland, she was in her 20s at the time. She said, Zach, are you familiar? You know, she said it, spoke in a heavy Polish accent. She said, are you familiar with flight TU-154? I said, sorry, no, I'm not. Well, you know, that's been my experience with most Americans. <laughs> They've never heard of it. And so would you mind? That's when you know, they killed nearly the entire Polish leadership. Yeah. And then when it went down, so there's KGB a, busy shooting them, finishing them off. Okay. So uh, I had never, my semester ago, and I had never heard of it. So she said, oh, yes. Something like 96 people were killed on this plane crash or in this plane crash. Seven crew members and 89 uh, passengers, including the president at the time, Lech Kaczynski, not to be confused with Ted Kaczynski. And he said, well, hey, so Zach, will you mind just telling me the backstory? Well, they're on their way over to Smolensk, Russia, to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Kintin Massacre. And, she, and Zach said, well, what was that? <laughs> and she said, fingers, oh. I mean, fingers, you know. <clears throat> And the Katyn massacre, where the I mean, NKVD shot all those Polish officers and intellectuals in the back of the head, and then buried them in mass graves, and then they blamed it on the Germans, blamed it on the Nazis. Well, well, first, well, actually, they said it never happened. Don't know what you're talking about. So for decades, they said it never. That's just some sort of unfounded rumor. Then, they said, then it came out. Yeah, it did happen, but as you said. They blamed the Nazis. And then they dug them up and they found all these corpses. Disgraceful. I have the pictures of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you, why am I bringing this up? And so, I got a, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry I've been sitting on this for over a year because I've been busy doing other things. But, um, I never, yes, I'd heard of the Katyn Massacre, thanks to you, but I'd never heard of Flight TU-154 until this girl, this young woman, brought it up. And she said, well, you know, they basically covered, they buried this story in the West because it's just, um, 
not very interesting, even though it's the worst Polish air disaster ever. Yeah, it's terrible, and the leadership of Poland was just destroyed. Okay. They were so they were exposing Russia for the Katyn massacre and be resisting Moscow. And so that was the end of their leadership. In Ukraine, they so, just started a war there rather than just destroy the leadership. Go ahead. Okay, so she, you know, she said, you know, um, you know, I, it surprised me they never, you know, this never got any recovery to the United States. You know, it would have probably made a, a great movie. But you see, okay, this, I believe in truth and honesty, almost all the people who were killed were not just Catholic, but were devout Catholics. They uh, Kaczynski went to mass every week, and I, I think. And then, but they were resisting they Russia. They were resisting the Russian government. Yeah. So, you know, the problem with Kaczynski is he probably thought he actually was the president. Yeah. Um, That's always so, a problem. That's always a problem. Whether it's Kennedy or Nixon or all these other guys, they they some of them have this illusion that they're the president, just like. Some of these popes have the illusion that they're the pope. Or George Patton thought he was a general. Or... Well, he was, but he thought that Eisenhower was on his side till he proved that Eisenhower was a traitor on several instances, especially when Eisenhower let the fanatical, massive, murderous, radical red, red machine rob, rape, and pillage all the Germans in the East Germany. Yep. So, okay. Yep, we go ahead. So getting to this plane crash, which took place on April the 10th, 2010, so just over 14 years ago, um, there was, I forgot the source. I Sorry, I should know this, but uh, I was watching a video on it, and it's in English, and they do uh, as an English translation of the voice recording from the uh, black box. And you know who the crew is. You, you have the captain, the co-pilot, and I guess the radio man, but you have this unknown fourth voice who appears to be giving the captain orders. As I said, they're talking Russian, but it's translated into English. And it seems that the captain is having some last minute trepidations. Now, for what it's worth, almost all airline pilots in Poland have a military background. And that's often the case, that's probably the case in most of the world. Their Air Force or here in the United States, maybe Navy, Navy Reserve, so something along those lines. And as I said, somebody is feeding this captain instructions. He's telling him what to do. And so um, the captain is saying, we're going, we're too fast. Uh, and the voice says, Main, uh, maintain speed, you have your orders. But the captain, <laughs> Jack says, we're going too fast. Maintain speed, you're going, you have your orders. And that's, that strikes me as odd. So, what do you think was going on in the cockpit? Well, they were probably deciding, listen, if we continue to fly like this, we're going to crash. But we're under orders. Now, a Calvinist who believes the Bible and who believes in uh, freedom of speech and freedom of conscience to think for yourself, uh, they're going to disobey. And we can't keep flying like this because we're going to crash, and so therefore I'm going to disobey the order, and I'm not going to crash. Just like those, those guys that were sent out with USS Liberty when the Israeli Air Force bombed them and strafed them. And the American fighters were dispatched and they got a call to come back from that dirty, filthy John McCain Sr. And uh, if there was a true Calvinist that was a pilot in those airplanes, uh, they would have said, uh, I didn't really, no, I'm not coming back. I'm going to find the Liberty before it goes to the bottom of the Mediterranean. And they would have kept flying and they'd have found it. And uh, then they could say, well, it's all shot up and, and you need to immediately come here. So, oh no, they all turned around like good little soldiers when they should have disobeyed the order. There's a time to disobey orders. And that was another one. But go ahead, George. Okay, this is something I don't know. And uh, I'm purely speculative. Well, I'm sure they probably anticipated that. Uh, they probably said, whoever it was, I don't know if we were a Jesuit actually in the cop cockpit with them or, you know, whatever the Polish version of the CIA is. Um, said, hey, Captain, it would be a tragedy if something were to happen. <laughs> you, you don't want anything to happen to your wife or to your children, do you? 
Yeah, when anybody would say that, that makes me immediately want to kill them. You know, you want to threaten my well, wife and children to do harm to them. You just turn me into something that I really don't want to be. But that's what the they should be met with when they want to threaten like that. Okay. The mafia calls it going to the mattresses, and that's what needs to be done. You know, it's all out war to the death. That's what men do. That's what Calvinists do. There's a time for war, and there's a time to fight, and the word of God is clear when that time is. So, under Bishop because they're Polish, they're Roman Catholic, they have no idea of the sort of just offense, and so they're going to go along with it, and they're going to get killed. Okay, well, it was unfortunate. So, as I said, they took uh, they took out not only the president, his wife, uh, several survivors of the massacre, uh, several several of their descendants, like children and grandchildren, were on the plane. And this girl, I didn't catch her name, but she said it was a very dark day in Polish history. It was like it was like nine eleven and JFK all rolled into one. I watched the special on that. And after the plane went down, you hear these gunshots going off. And the narrator was saying that this is the this is the KGB killing these survivors in this airplane, making sure they're all dead. So they knew where they were going to crash. They were on scene, on site, and then started the killing, making sure that no one would survive. But that's Jesuitism at its finest. The Jesuit KGB, uh, Jesuit USSR. Go ahead. Okay, and people forget that. They'll say communism, they'll say Bolsheviks, or they'll say Lenin or Stalin. But who is controlling them? Who financed them? Who who put them in power? Who kept them in power? Yeah. Who, and who, yeah, who, who, who gave them a successful civil war from, what, 1918 to 1922? And, you know, who financed them? Like Warren Harding, the 30th. Well, Degree Freemason. I mean, you know, there's no Bolshevism, there's no communism in Russia without District of Columbia. Same way with China. So, whoever runs the District of Columbia runs Moscow, runs Beijing. Uh, and it's something I wanted to mention, and probably some other other topics I'd like to address. But I think I'll just close out with this. Now we're talking about plane crashes. Now, as I said, this basically. Even though it only happened just over 14 years ago, most people in the United States have never heard of this. Unless you're Polish or you have family in Poland, it was just a non-event. And, of course, most people had never heard of the Katyn Massacre. That's right. And yes, you know, people might know about the German and Poland invasion of Poland on September the 1st, 1939. But people, <laughs> most people don't know what happened a couple weeks later. When Russia invaded from the east. Yeah, on September, what, 17th, 18th? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so there, thereabouts. Yeah. So they, yeah, they divided the place up, reduced Poland, killed all the manhood that would have resisted them so they can have their six death camps, which Stalin and Hitler built together, overseen by American cartel capitalists like Van Gogh. Well, I, I know I brought this up before, but it, not to. But it wasn't just the initial invasion of Poland in 1939 and the subsequent partitioning of it. You know, Poland was promised. Uh, it wasn't it. It wasn't uh, Churchill, I guess Chamberlain and whoever the leader of France was. They were promised backing. Uh, they said if Germany were to invade Poland, France and uh, Britain would invade Germany from the west. So the German, the Franco-German border was virtually undefended. The French and the British could have gone in Berlin on roller skates and taken taken over the place, because all their almost all their resources were concentrated in the east in Poland. Mm-hmm. So, but it just didn't, didn't stop there. You had two uprising uprisings in 1943 and a year later, where basically they, they said the same thing. Oh, but it wasn't just Britain. In France, you had the United States and you had Russia, the USSR. Said, "Oh yes, we'll we'll back you. We'll give you air support." And did they? Um, well, 
Not really. Uh, Not really. That's right. And they they incited the Polish men to rise up against their Nazi occupiers. <clears throat> and Stalin <coughs> he would come to their aid. And what does he do? He has his Red Army six miles away in the woods, just watching the Nazi German soldiers destroy Polish uprising. And that was necessary because Poland was going to be put under Joseph Stalin. And they don't want a manhood that's going to resist him. So we'll let the Nazis kill him for us. Because Hitler and Stalin work together for the Pope. Yeah, George. Okay. Any final words before we go? Okay. Can I mention one other thing? I'll give you a dispensation, George, but this is the last dispensation I'm going to give thee. Okay. So, fair enough. Now, you mentioned uh, for years that you were born in Oakland, California, and you grew up nearby in Honol. So, you were obviously, and you said you had relatives in Sacramento, the, the one of your grandparents lived there. Yeah, my mother's parents, the Callahans. Okay, you're uh, so you're obviously familiar with Travis Air Force Base in Fairfield. Yep. Okay, because it's roughly halfway between, say, Oakland and Sacramento. Mm-hmm. And do you, so, do you know how it got its name? No, I don't. <clears throat> well, I'd imagine most of your listeners don't either. It was named after General Robert. Uh, Travis, who was in the air, he was he joined the, originally it was called the Army Air Corps, then it became the Army Air Forces, and finally the Army uh, the Air Force. Now originally the Air Force, what would become the Air Force, was part of the Department of the Army. There again, I'm boring people with extraneous details. It did not actually become a separate service until September the 12th, 1947, and and the last place where uh, Travis, Robert Travis, was stationed, what was then called Fairfield Susan Field, which opened in 1942. Mm-hmm. And on August the 5th, he was born in 1904. I don't have his birthday in front of him, but you can look it up. On um, August the 5th, he was doing a test flight of a B-29 Super Fortress, and it had an accident, and it blew up <laughs> midair. Um, my mind, that sounds like a coincidence, George. Yes, blowing up in and there's something like eight. So, he and 18 other crew members were killed. So, a couple months later, in October of 1950, they decided to rename the base in his honor. Now, I looked into Travis's background, and I is probably a Freemason or something along those lines. I don't know what religious affiliation he was. Now, as I said, the Air Force did not become its own separate branch until 1947. And so they're saying the the leadership of the Air Force, Henry Hap Arnold, Carl Spotts, uh, Curtis LeMay, were saying, hey, you know what? The Army has its own academy academy at West Point. The Navy has theirs in Annapolis, in Maryland. You know, we should have our own. So there's a debate as to where it should be. Now, as you know, the enlisted, they have their basic training, their recruit training in Lackland Air Force Base in, near San Antonio. You know that empirically. I sure do, and I remember how hot it was. Your was basic training. So go ahead. Ah, so, any of that's where my dad got his basic training. So, they're having debate, you know, where should the Air Force Academy be? Well, there are three candidates. Uh, Wright Patterson Airfield uh, near Dayton, Ohio, which is where uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, LeMay was from, who was an apostate Methodist who was of Huguenot descent and a high level Freemason. Yeah, he created the SAC. second choice. Yes. Yeah. He but, created um, strategic air command. Yeah, go ahead. Along with Knight of Malta, General Thomas Power. And uh, we've talked about him, but that was years ago. Mm-hmm. The second candidate was uh, was Carl Spass's hometown of Colorado Springs, Colorado. And the third choice would have been just north of San Francisco, where Henry Hap Arnold lived. So Arnold. Was, oh, I know what they should have done. They should have George, George, George. They should have started the Air Force Academy at Bohemian Grove. Why, that's a perfect place, just north of. The Jesuit Orders University there. That would have been a great place. Go ahead. 
Well, I'm sure that, okay, so anyhow, so Arnold um, had a, Henry Hab Arnold, who was an independent Baptist, but a high-level Freemason, had a fatal heart attack on June, on January the 15th, 1950, and his friend, Bob Travis, Robert Travis, also was killed in a plane crash about six months later, or eight months later, so that eliminated the two obstacles to the academy being built in Northern California. Now, they would if you're here, when I say here, I'm talking about the North Bay of California, um, they would have flown out of Hamilton Field in Nevada, Northern Marin County, and they would have taken their classes in the then unincorporated area between Santa Rosa and Petaluma, the current location of Sonoma State University, which is where I actually got my degree. Well, good, George. Uh, <laughs> so, so, anyhow, That's as careful, I said, George, if you're not careful, I'm going to give you the third degree. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, 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 fair enough. So, anyhow, so Arnold died of a heart attack in January, and Travis was killed in a plane crash in August. So, they said, well, even though we were going to build the academy there, we'll decide to build it in Colorado Springs. Goody. So Colorado Springs right near Denver, and uh, we have the Regis University of the Jesuits there in Denver, and they're going to oversee Colorado Springs. they got the deep underground things going on there. So it's a perfect place for the new capital when the new right comes to power, according to John Roy Carlson in his book, Undercover, written in 1942. So, yep, very good. Okay, so that was the year that what was then Travis Air Force Base opened. It was originally called uh, Fairfield Susan Airfield. So, mm-hmm. I, I just presented a couple of facts, but I really have no proof. This is pure speculation on my part. It was awfully convenient that the the two major proponents of the Air Force Academy being in Northern California, died <laughs> right around the same time as each other. Yep. Amen. Well, it's obvious to me that it's a coincidence, George. And we just got to stop okay, talking so, about all these conspiracies, okay? If things so just what, happen. If things just happen, George. And it's just like just like your body. It evolved over years and, and millennium and millions of years. And it's just, just happened, George. It's all a coincidence. So anyway, brother. Okay, so Thank could you. I... If you want to give a final word here, then I'm going to have to close up because I think our audience might have had enough of us, and it's going on an hour and 20 minutes. Okay, so, yes, I just want, want to respond to a uh, recent stream you did with Stephen Reich. Oh, yeah. uh, it wasn't your last broadcast. It was the one before that. He was talking about Aldous Huxley, mm-hmm. um, and he said he couldn't find any sort of Jezebel on him, any sort of anything incriminating on him. Well, for what it's worth, all this Huxley died on November the 22nd, 1963. Yes, November the 22nd, 1963. Same day they killed Kennedy. Okay, that's interesting. Also, it was on that date that Clive Staples, C.S. Lewis, who won by, also won by Jack, died in England. So C.S. Lewis died on that same date, too? Yes, it, it would have been. Uh, it wouldn't have, it would have been you know that evening, but yes, he died on November the twenty second, nineteen sixty two. Also, Aldous Huxley was the brother of Julian Huxley. Yes, he was. Who was British intelligence. Yes. But also, their grandfather Thomas Huxley was a member of the Royal Society. Uh, he was known. Thomas Huxley was known as Darwin's bulldog. He was also known as uh, Tommy the Tiger. Uh, because of his shoving, uh, of shoving evolution down the throats of the historic white British Protestants. Great. Uh, yes. So I just thought it would uh, also, can I just share one little factoid? Sure, George. Okay, this, this is completely off topic, but one of the sites <laughs> I like to go <laughs> now, I, I realize I mentioned Zach Hubbard and I have some disagreements with Zach, but that's uh, that's another conversation for another day. Well, I Somebody whom I like to listen to is William Boot from Canada, who does Darkness is Falling. I have some big problems with him, although he has recommended your book, Vatican Assassins. Oh, now, okay. not on his last video, but the video before now, that. George, talking, slow down. What's his name again, please? William. William what? William Boot. Cut out. Boot. William, uh, Boot. Boot. William Boot. 
Okay. B double O T isn't like uh, something you wear in your foot or what the British call a, a trunk of a car. I see. Okay. And you were saying now? Okay, I have some disagreements with William, but I, I won't broach those. Um, not in his previous video, but the video before that, he was doing um, uh, the history of medical warfare, basically. And he showed a picture of Louis Pasteur from, I guess, the late 19th century. And Pasteur is wearing what appears to be a Maltese cross. Good. Pasteur is wearing a Maltese cross. It shows you he's a knight. He was Roman Catholic. He put out that awful, terrible germ theory that the Pope's medical profession rests on, one of their foundations, to justify prescribing all these drugs for all these symptoms caused by all these germs. Yep. Allopathic medicine is a total farce and scam, and Louis Pasteur was part of its establishment. So. All right, George. Well, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for telling us that Louis Pasteur was a knight of Malta. And um, please give us your contact information so that if the listener wants to call you or get in contact, he can. Okay. So, um, well, um, if people have any questions, comments, concerns, or critiques, uh, they can email me at georgewidger1969 gmail.com. That's G E O R G E W I D G E R. 1969 at gmail.com. Once again, that's G E O R G E W I D G E R 1969 at gmail.com. If they didn't get that, they can uh, get that from you. Um, also, Bidger at 1969 at what? Gmail.com. Gmail.com. Okay, good. Yeah, very good, George. And any other thing you would like to tell us before we go? Uh, so if people have, if they want me to go over a topic or a topic again, uh, please let me know. And I'll do my best to get back to you in a timely manner, well, hopefully within 24 hours or so. And folks, that's any topic. <clears throat> George can find stuff on any topic. So make sure well, you contact him, and bring up the subject, and we'll entertain it on the radio here. We believe in freedom of speech, right, George? Uh, well, just as so long as it doesn't defend me. <laughs> All right then. All righty then. Well, <laughs> well, it's just so long as it's a speech I, I agree with. There you go. Okay, Brother George, thank you for being with us today. Brother Eric John Phelps, 24 7 World Radio, on this podcast on this beautiful May the 7th, 2024. Please uh, pray for us, George and myself, two minutes a day, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And uh, you can send your gifts to RBPB Donate at comcast.net if you want to use paypal or you can send it to eric eric john j-o-n phelps p-h-e-l-p-s at cash app or you can do it do it the old way the old way or the best ways send a check to rbt p.o box 306 newmanstown pennsylvania 17073 so until we meet again may the lord bless you to do his will according to his word the av 1611 reformation english bible in its present clarified edition of 1769. And until we meet, Lord bless Maranatha.